as Brad and Shaylee and, and Evan and Damien have led us so well to focus our minds and our hearts on you. Lord, we come to you. Many of us are broken and hardly have the strength to look up right now, Lord. And so those are in that situation. Father, for those that have the sun on their face and the wind at their back, would you help us to carry our brothers and sisters? Just this, Lord Jesus, we come just as we are. And so would you mold us? Would you comfort us? Would you convict us? Would you speak to us, Father? We need to hear from you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 So as we uh, go ahead, and please be seated. You're going to grab that, Brad. In just a moment, I'm going to bring a friend up here. Uh, you've heard me speak over uh, the years, uh, maybe over the past even months, about hungry souls. You've heard me speak before about our church really working hard to be a missional church. And before I go any further, you know what I'm going to do right now? Children. It's children's worship time. Yes, I almost forgot, but for an amazing kids ministry leader who's making faces at me, kindergartners through fifth graders, if you'd like to be excused, if you want, if it's okay with your family, you head right on back there to that back lobby. Miss Leanne and Bracken and Brother Stephen and Shane, we have a team of people waiting on, on you right now to go back there and have an amazing time of church. Yes, I almost forgot it. Hungry Souls. Hungry Souls is an amazing with for a little more than a year or so now. You've also heard me talk about Tiger Souls. And rather than me trying to explain all this to you, my good friend Chris King. Come on up here, Chris King from Hungry Souls slash Tiger Souls. Come on, do you remember? You might recognize Chris. Chris, in fact, a little more than a year ago, I had my first bout with coronavirus. And out of the blue, I called Chris and said, Chris, I wanted to try to talk about the, the hunger problem in Dripping Springs. And I'm sick as a dog right now. And this amazing about three days notice and said, I got you covered, Clay. We'll have an amazing Sunday morning. I'll preach the best I can. I'll also talk about this ministry and, and what our church is trying to do. So I'm excited to have Chris back. This is your second time. Now, I noticed you took a year to ask me to come back. Well, so. that's, a, that's about the pace that we're going to do right here, about every year or two. You, you may remember, Chris and I have known each other for decades from our church back in South Austin as we've led a trip to Guatemala. You remember that last summer church, how our church had an international mission trip? It's because of this man who once went to Guatemala and started something that never had existed before. And as God has led him into new ministry areas, he has been in the trenches of feeding hungry men and women and kids for how many years now have you been with Hungry Souls? Uh, four years. Four years of nonstop, 100% ministry dedication. Remind our church, what is Hungry Souls even to begin with? Yeah, we're a nonprofit uh, located in South Austin, and we partner with schools around the greater Austin area, uh, Austin, Dripping Springs, uh, Elgin, uh, Bastrop, Maynard, soon to come Johnson City, uh, to feed kids and their families over the weekends and during school breaks when they may not have food to eat. And tell me, insofar as a partnership, you're wearing a shirt, which by the way, I'm jealous. I didn't see you bring me an, an XL, and that's okay. But I see a Tiger Soul shirt. What is Tiger Souls? Yes, it was a shameless beg for a t-shirt, I promise. If it, never mind. Um, uh, Tiger Souls is kind of just our offshoot of Hungry Souls. Uh, when we came out, uh, came out here, gosh, right at the beginning of the school year, mm -hmm. um, there had been another program operating, and unfortunately, they had to cease operations. Uh, and the school actually called Clay. Clay called me. We all got together, and so this is just what we're labeled out here is, is Tiger Souls. The ministry effort. And remind our church, when we say feeding kids now in Dripping Springs, how many kids is your ministry with partners like First Baptist and others? How many families are we serving right now? Uh, right now we're serving 150 families or 150 kids here in the Dripping Springs ISD. Uh, that represents about 98 families. And uh, they've already asked if we could add some more here in the coming weeks. So it's a growing problem, a growing issue. And are these kids just at Dripping Springs Elementary School? Uh, we've got Dripping Springs Elementary School, Walnut Springs. Uh, we've got the middle school, the high school, and actually just added a few at uh, Sycamore. Sycamore Springs Elementary yeah. School as well. Uh, you've got lots of experience in this area, Chris. 
describe to our church uh, the gravity or the depth of the problem, of, of the need out here in our community? Yeah, as we tell people that we're serving kids in Dripping Springs, they go, really, in Dripping Springs? There's a hunger issue? Uh, and there is. Uh, you know, most of the time when you're driving up and down, you know, the 12 and 290, you just see the really nice neighborhoods. And uh, but there are lots of families that are living off these little side streets and trailer parks and some of the little old homes that are out here that are experiencing hardship right now. Uh, many of our families uh, have been in the service area. And of course, you know, with COVID and so many places getting shut down, they all lost their jobs. Yeah. And so it's a growing need uh, out here in the area and especially out in the whole hill country as a whole because most of the smaller towns outside of big cities don't have someone to help feed hungry families. Yeah. So describe for us what is it on a normal week, whether you want to walk through the whole week or just jump to, to Thursday or Friday or Saturday, but what exactly are we doing for these children uh, in these schools that you know are going home hungry? You didn't tell me you were going to ask that one. Anyway, <laughs> um, but every week what we do is on uh, typically Tuesday or Wednesday we get our food deliveries in. Uh, we are currently located out here at the old Walnut Springs Elementary. And so we have food deliveries come in from different places uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. We get those inventoried and shelved. And then on Thursday morning, we have a group of folks, and some of you have been to serve with us, that come out and uh, help us bag up uh, all the bags. And then uh, Friday mornings, we have a group that comes out and takes those bags out to the school so they can be distributed to the kids. Wow. And you have exactly how many kids was it again? 101? 150. 150. Uh, our church has been involved for uh, some amount of time. What do you need? What help do you need? What, what, uh, how could we step up maybe a little bit more than we already have and be a blessing to both Tiger Souls but also to these kids that are hungry? Sure. One of the things we're, we're facing right now is uh, come March 12th, we're going to be losing our space over at the school. Uh, just because uh, it's a school that's getting ready to be refurbished, and uh, so anybody who's in the school is having to leave, not just us. And uh, so we're looking for a space. We need uh, about 1,000 to 1,500 square feet to operate in. So if you know of anything out here in the area, please come see me afterwards and let us know. Uh, I'll also be out in the back, and we've got, uh, we've got a little handout out there with uh, two QR codes on there. Okay. The top one is to sign up to volunteer to come help us either bag bags or deliver bags. Uh, those spots go quickly, so if you wanna come volunteer, please do that. And then the other QR code is to donate because we're always looking for, uh, we've gotta purchase all of our food, and so we're looking for that. But if you wanna do a food drive, if you live in a neighborhood, if you work someplace, if you go to school, play on a baseball team, I mean, basically, if you can fog up a mirror, you can do a food drive. Hmm. And uh, so come see me back there, and we'll help you set that up and get that done. Tell me, what other partners do you have now? I doubt that First Baptist alone is the only uh, church organization that's jumping in with Tiger Souls. Who else are you working with out here in our community? That's the only one that matters. Yeah, of course. No, okay. it's a... no uh, uh, Bannockburn Dripping Springs is also helping us out. Uh, the Methodist Church out here and the Presbyterian Church out here as well. Good. And there's room for more. Absolutely. Always. Yeah. Where is Brad around? Where'd Brad go? I just want to spend a little bit of time before we uh, say goodbye to Chris. He's just going to come sit back down here. But we have a time of prayer. Uh, and Brad wears many hats at our church. He's also the chair of our wonderful missions committee. And I've just asked if maybe, Brad, if we could spend some time collectively as a congregation praying over Chris in this ministry, praying over hungry souls, tiger souls, maybe even these kids and these families, these educators that are right there in the trenches with these people. the great privilege to partner with a ministry like that, God, and be a part of what uh, the body of Christ is doing in Dripping Springs and, and what the Holy Spirit is doing, actively doing in Dripping Springs. So, Lord, we just continue to pray that through meeting these tangible needs uh, for families in Dripping Springs, Lord, um, that people would see you, yeah, Lord, that you would be glorified, that you would be made much of in this community, in this town, Lord. And we also pray that um, some of these families, Lord, um, would also have that need met of and just them being 
uh, reconciled to you, Lord. And so, God, help keep our eyes open to those opportunities, Lord. Uh, prompt us uh, to, to be there, to share Christ with families that may end up maybe walking through these doors one day through, through a ministry. Uh, we pray for the, the families and the students that are being impacted by this ministry, Lord, that you would be with those families, God, that you would show yourselves to them, Lord, uh, that they would come to know you uh, in a, a saving uh, faith in Jesus mm. Christ, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate you. As Chris wanders back, uh, and he did say he's going to be back in our missions area after our worship service today, I would love for you to go back there and, and maybe give him a fist bump, give him a little bit of word of encouragement. If you have any questions, I guarantee you he'll be able to answer any of those, and if he doesn't, he'll get you an answer. I, I promise uh, Chris is just this kind of man. I've bragged about him for a long, long time, and most anything that I know about about living missionally and about and being a part of a church that is a missional church, it flows originally through the work that God has done through this man. So he is helping lead us as we step out into this community. And it breaks my heart that there are kids that go home hungry on a Romans. We call that book of the Bible there in our New Testament, the book of Romans. You may be reminded that Paul wrote this letter to the church and to the Christians, both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians there in Rome. When he wrote this letter, he wasn't in Rome. He was actually in Corinth. And Corinth was a large metropolitan city where Paul was located at that time. It was a very sophisticated city. And at the time that Paul was alive, Corinth had approximately 700,000 people in its population in that area. And so this was a very urban place. This was a seat of great commerce. There was an amazing amount of commerce and money that was coming and going through the city of Corinth. This was a hot spot for intellectual elites, for philosophers for great thinkers and writers of all sorts. I mean, everything imaginable that you sophisticated urban center was found right there in Corinth where Paul was located. And you know what also was found there was every unimaginable vice and behavior and corruption and depravity of all sorts. A lot of it sexual in nature. There were sexual practices that were done there in the city of Corinth that were done in private, but also were done as a part of worship to, to the Greek goddess of Aphrodite. And, and there, was, there was a very uh, unashamed approach to sexuality in those days. There were things going on in the city of Corinth that would make us Americans in 2022 even blush. Because we would say, yeah, we're not quite that far gone, right? This is the city that Paul was located on, and they did these things unapologetically. There was a level of corruption in Corinth that was unapologetic about it uh, in Paul's days. And so, said briefly, when we think about Corinth, where we think about where Paul was as God inspired him to write this letter, he was in a city full of pagans who were living a life of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, okay? This is the place where Paul was, and Rome was no better, okay? Rome was not much different from where Paul was physically located there in Corinth. And so I'm utterly convinced that Paul knew that he had to share this life-changing, eternally good news of the gospel with these people in this place called Rome. In fact, any righteous teacher, any righteous religious man such as Paul would look at those people living the way they were living, behaving the way they were behaving, and say, they need help. I have to write to them. But do you know who else he was writing to at the exact same time? At the exact same time that Paul was writing to people that were, that were behaving and living in ways that were utterly despicable, he was also writing to that amazing young mother who had a house full of kids, and she loved her kids, and she loved them well. 
And, and, and she was an amazing wife. She loved her husband with all of her life, with all of her heart. She was dedicated to her family. She was dedicated to her husband tirelessly. She tried to live a life that was moral and upright and, and behave in such a way that other people say, I want to be like her. That, that's the type of woman, that's the type of mother I want to be. Paul was writing to her. You know who else he was writing to? He was writing to her husband. He, he was writing to that man, uh, as Paul wrote and he wrote and he wrote, he, he was writing to that husband that loved his wife. And he actually loved his kids. And he wasn't living like these pagans over here who were doing almost For himself and for his family, he provided for him. This man, in fact, was actually highly regarded in the community because people looked at him and said, I want to be like that guy. He's honest and he works hard and he's religious and he constantly and consistently practices this faith that he talks about as he worships this God. And I believe with an equally heavy heart about those two people as there were about those so-called pagans or all the religious fest you were just as broken as these gentiles who don't even know what the word yahweh means see paul has been building moment by moment to where we are today he's been building because he's laid this foundation that the whole world is under the wrath of god gentiles are guilty moral people are too and even god's elect the jews of paul's day are just as guilty and he's gone on just last week to say, in fact, you're just as guilty. How do you conclude this teaching? As Paul, paragraph after paragraph, has been writing to us about this, turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 3. And I'm going to pick up in verse 9. Paul, picking up this thought, says this, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. Verse 18. There is before their eyes. Now we know the
those days in God's sacred writings, and he's reached back and he's quoted from Psalm 5, he's quoted from Psalm 10, he's quoted from Psalm 14 and 36 and 53, he's quoted from Psalm 140, he's even quoted from the prophet Isaiah in those passages that we just saw there. And what he's saying is that whether you're moral, whether you're immoral, there is no difference in God's eyes. And remember, these aren't Paul's words necessarily. He's not coming to us and saying, I've heard something that no man has ever heard. He's reminding those faithful men and women, these are the words of the Lord. God has been saying this to us for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, that we all stand in judgment of the ultimate judge, and that is the Lord God himself. So what does that mean? Look at verse 19. Skip down to verse 19, and he tells us this encouraging word that nobody is righteous, right? No one understands or seeks for God. And then in verse 19, he says, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. That word there that Paul uses, accountable, it is a judicial word. It means that we are to be held liable to God because of our ways. And so what Paul says is no matter who you are, no matter what your record, so to speak, looks like, no matter how kind and how compassionate this week, are we having fun yet, church? <laughs> you know, when does it get to be fun? And, and I just really do want to ask a serious question. How does that even remotely sound fair? It's kind of offensive, isn't it? It's offensive for a, a person to write, for a man to stand up here on a microphone. He lived. You were just as corrupt as the lawbreaker, as the murderer, as the kidnapper, as the one who was so violent. And the reason why this is offensive to us is because the gospel can offend us. No man or woman is ever given the privilege of offending anybody. But God's gospel message offends us sometimes to our very core. And the reason for that is, is that the gospel looks beneath the surface. I can clean up as well as anybody can, right? And you can too. And the gospel says, I'm underneath all of that we're all full of sin see church the gospel comes in and destroys this notion that a lot of us have had over our lives And all of these bad things that have happened. lives there are people who live bad lives and according to God in the way that he views us we are all alike 
We are all alike. Since the start of chapter 1 of Romans, Paul has been teaching us that I am no better than the man who robs, the man who kills, than the man who destroys. In God's eyes, I too politics and all of their views of how we're to live are they those crazy liberals or conservatives i'm sorry you just can't talk to because all they want to do is wear a red hat and you can't ration you can't speak to them in any sort of of just kind of even and tempered way because they're just so far gone who who is it who are those people is it the lesbian or the gay or the bisexual i'm forgetting all the alphabets there the the transsexual uh, the so-called queer or the plus sign and all at the plus sign are, are those the Gentiles in your life and in my life where we look at them and go, okay, maybe we don't see it out loud, but they're dogs. They're unclean. I can't, I can't fellowship with them. How could I possibly do that? Are they people who have different color skin? Who are the Gentiles in my lives? Or are they those people that, that are really in favor of mandating that you have to have a vaccine? Are they those people who are really, really, you have to have a vaccine? As we've been speaking right now, who is the Holy Spirit bringing to your mind's eye to say, yeah, those are my Gentiles? Think about this. The gospel, that he would ever have looked at those heretics, those infidels, those spiritual dogs called Gentiles, and said, you know what? We're equal. I'm no better than they are. They're no better than I am. Do you think Paul ever could have said that? Before we met Jesus, you know the answer. Of course not, because Paul tells us the answer. He utterly despised those people before he met Christ. So what happened to him? What happened to him is on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus Christ. And part of what the Lord himself uh, said to Paul and opened up Paul's eyes was to this notion or this idea of the total depravity of humanity. And he, Paul, was smart enough to know that Paul fits under the definition of human. The total depravity of of humanity. Total depravity, it's an old theological term. You're not going to hear a lot of pastors that love to stand up and talk about it on a Sunday morning, right? But it's an old theological term that describes the idea, simply put, that the world is not full of good people and full of bad people, but that all people are lost, that all people need salvation, that all people are are sinful. See, total depravity isn't to say that you're not as bad as you can be or, or that you ever will be, but total depravity is saying this, sin has affected every part of your being. So sin has affected my mind and my emotions and my conscience. Sin has affected my ability to see accurately other people. Sin has affected my ability to see myself accurately. Sin has affected my, even my moral reasoning and my ability to think in, in a properly moral kind of way. And this is the idea of the total depravity of man. Think about it this way as you think about total depravity. I read this recently. If sin were blue, if sin were the color blue, we would be blue all over. 
Now, there are parts of me that would be darker blue than maybe other parts. Other parts of me might be a little bit lighter blue. Or maybe there's some parts of me that would be in between a dark blue and a light blue. But one thing is true. Every part of me, every part of you would have the shade, some shade of blue. And this truth, this truth of the total depravity of mankind should cause us to see people differently than we actually have done before. And here's what I mean by that. All kinds of people that you would have never loved before, you could never respect them. You could never give them the time of day. The the teaching that Paul gives us and the Lord gives us throughout his scripture of the total depravity of mankind causes us to say, you know what? I'm no better than he is. I'm no better than he is. So I want to see him as fully human I want to see him as a child of God, made in the very image of God, who, yes, maybe is doing some absolutely profane things and some absolutely foul things, but I'm no better, right? I have my own sin in my life. And then when we begin to see people like that, you know what we then can do a whole lot more easily? We can love them as Jesus commanded us to love them. I don't know about you, church, but I have a really hard time loving people who I look at and hate at the same time. Okay, I don't hate, right? We're not supposed to say that word. I have a really hard time loving people who I look at them and privately, you know what? I'm disgusted by them, by their thoughts, by their words, by the way they live their lives. Paul would sit here, if he were standing here today, and he'd say, Clay, you're no better. You you have the same sin struggles that they do. Have you noticed how even today in 2022, we all find a way to look down on each other. And I'm going to submit to you, this is a worldwide phenomenon. There's many in this room who have lived and have worked all around the world. I haven't necessarily, but I had one experience one time when I was still practicing law back in 2006 or seven, where a work project took me to the other side of the world in the land down under of Australia. And I'm talking about the other side of the world and on the bottom half of the world is where I had to get to in Brisbane, Australia for about a month. My clients at that time were a bunch of local Australians and an oil and gas company there. And for almost a month, I lived in a hotel room, and six days a week, I was in those clients' offices, and I were in their offices, I was in their conference rooms, and I really did enjoy learning about people on the other side of the world and on the bottom half of the world, and especially Australians, right? Because they're a whole lot like Texans. They think a whole lot like we do. I promise you that. But here's one of the big takeaways that that I came home from that trip, and Sharon heard me talk about this till she was tired of hearing about it. You know what? We're all alike. We're all alike, even when they're on the other side of the world, on the bottom half of the world, people are people. And two little vignettes really drove this home. Two encounters made me come back to Texas saying this. The first one involved church in Brisbane, Australia. I I could not be... give this thing a try and so on a Sunday morning at the right time I walked a handful of blocks to this particular church in downtown Brisbane and it was a big church and they like us they had pews ours are nicer than theirs theirs were just solid wooden pews with one long center aisle and like every good first-time guest where do you sit when you're a first-time guest you always go to the back right you never come way up front who would ever want to do that so I too slipped into that church and just a handful of rows in there were empty seats all over the place the whole church only ended up with about a third uh, of people that would fill up those seats and I slipped into one of those back rows and I sat right there on the edge because that's what you do when you're a first time guest in case I got to jump up and run out of this place right and about a minute before the service was to start I had this tap on my shoulder and all around were empty pews in fact empty seats on each side of me and you know exactly what I'm about to tell you right now don't you what did this little woman with a beautiful Australian accent say to me the first word said to me by anybody at that church you're in my seat (laughs) yeah there's terrible behavior all around the world isn't it people behave like that on the southern hemisphere and on the northern hemisphere i looked to my right i looked to my left there were dozens and dozens of spots available but i sat in her seat people are all the same church 
A second thing I experienced one time, that my clients had a break room there in Australia, and this is where I spent most of my coffee and, and eating some lunch, was in this break room, and that the folks were coming and going, and they, they kind of enjoyed listening to a hillbilly Texan like me, and I enjoyed listening to them. And, and you know, we have ways of saying things that are different than the way Australians say things. I don't remember the proper uh, grammatical idioms, cliches, whatever you want to say, just old country sayings. And, and I was constantly uh, confusing them when I would say something that you and I would perfectly understand. And they go, what, do what? I mean, these are English words that you're saying, Clay, but they don't make any sense. And here's one that I said, as we're having lunch one day, I said, hey, I've got a theory about people. I think that people all around the world always look for somebody to look down their nose at. Who do you Australians look down your nose at? And they stared and go, I have no idea what you're asking me. And I said, no, seriously, who do you look down your nose at? And again, they're like, you're going to have to translate, Clay. We, we, don't, we don't talk like that down here. And I said, who do you think you're better than? And they immediately got to go, oh, the ability to look at other people and say I'm not like that I'm not like that and we do it today uh, maybe you don't have a whole lot of financial resources and you look to people who are really rich and you say you know what they're filthy rich and they're selfish and they're greedy and I'm glad I'm not like that guy I I'm glad the Lord hasn't blessed me with all that money because I don't want to be like that family and maybe you have a lot of resources and maybe you've, you've struggled at times of looking at people who have hardly anything and say, man, I'm glad I'm not like this poor guy over here. He's clearly done something wrong because he doesn't have anything to his name. You know, you know, there are folks that look at the middle class, which most of us here in this room, we'd be considered kind of the middle class of American society today. There's a lot who look at us and go, they got no taste. They got no culture. They don't care anything about the arts. They don't read for the sake of learning. They, they just want to be kind of entertained. And then those middle class kinds of folks like you and me, when we look at those, those creative types, we look at those artists, we look at those songwriters, we, we look at those folks and we look at them and kind of say, yeah, they're just a bunch of freaks. Older people than me, it's all a bunch of hippies, right? Remember that expression? We're really good at looking around at other people, where there is those insane liberals, where there is those insane conservatives. And ultimately, we may not say that, you know what? At least I'm not like that guy. Paul comes in and says, you cannot say that. You cannot think like that. And at the same time, embrace the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as I begin to kind of land the plane, how can this be fair? How, these verses are hard. No one is righteous. No, not one. As I look to other people, I often compare, and she's going to hate this, I often compare other people to my wife. I often compare other people to my sweet grandmother Mary, to my amazing father. And nobody measures up to those people, right? And you have people like that in your lives who you say, they don't measure up. They do not add up to that. I often compare myself to people. And what I do, I always compare myself to the criminal, right? I compare myself to the drug dealers. And, and I always look good when I compare myself to other people. Church, what the scripture teaches us is that God does not judge this way. And he doesn't look at people this way. Because the standard that he uses isn't my wife or my father, or me, the standard that he uses is his own sinless perfection, his own spotless holiness, his own perfect love and beauty, his own perfect wisdom and justice. That is the standard by which we are measured. And obviously compared to him, no one measures up. No one even comes close. So what are we to do with that then? What are we to do with that? This is where Paul, in Romans, in chapter 3 now, he's going to begin to turn. And he's finally going to begin to turn this corner into the good news of the gospel. Because as we've said before, we all need salvation. 
but you're not ready for salvation until you understand how broken you are and how you cannot fix yourselves. So, in fact, even beating yourself up, if you've done it like I have maybe over these past, past couple of weeks, even beating yourself up about how bad you are, sometimes that can be just another demonstration of your self-centeredness where it's all about me and it's all about me. Paul's coming in and saying, be quiet. I want you to listen. I want you to come to the very end of yourself. I really do because Paul says, I know the one who saves. See, Christianity is God seeking you and God finding you and God saving you. And once you know and once you what Jesus did for you and he did for me on the cross that awful day once you turn to him in faith and confess him to be Lord and return and repent from the life that you've been living and acknowledge him as your king and as your savior and you walk the wrath that I deserve I've done nothing to earn that 